Welcome to Oxford News This Week. I'm Elgin Nichols. And I'm Terry Stiles. And in this week's local news, there's breaking and entering going on around town. And Oxford community is booming. Stay tuned and learn more about these stories and others. The Oxford News begins right now. An Oxford Township man reported that a 38 caliber handgun had been stolen from his parents' home. The man was checking on his parents' vacant home when he discovered that the entry door had been smashed open. When officers arrived, they discovered that the interior of the home was in disarray. The handgun appears to be the only item taken. During the investigation, deputies determined that the robbery must have happened several months ago and there were no other leads in the investigation. But it continues as an open case. A client is suspected of scalping a pair of $1,000 scissors from a downtown hair salon. Deputies were told that the stylist client may be the suspect, but when the client's home was searched, there was no evidence found to implicate the client. The salon owner is now checking security footage for evidence. Marijuana was found on a young man at Crossroads for Youth the past week. But the youth told officers that he was not the person who purchased the goods, and he received the drugs from another resident. Officers confiscated the marijuana. On the following day, officers again were called out to Crossroads for use. The two residents had left the ground and failed to return. Officers posted an APB on the youths to be on the lookout for two boys missing from Oxford Crossroads for youth. A woman was caught by store employees attempting to steal four bottles of rum from a store on Lapeer Road. The suspect was held by employees until officers arrived and she was issued a citation for third degree retail fraud and providing false information to police. If a Rochester-based residential construction company, Hamlin LLC, has their way, it will build a 32-unit housing project on 42 acres in Oxford Township. White Pines Estates is the proposed project and will be located on the north side of Stanton Road, east of Baldwin, and west of Coates Road. Currently, the property is zoned Suburban Farms, which calls for a minimum of five acres on the plot. The company's first step is to request a rezoning under a planned unit development, which would provide the company with more flexibility within the township process. It's a given. Oxford Village residents will see their water and sewer bills change starting in October. After many meetings and consultations, the Village Council agreed 4 to 1 to cover sewer and water expenses by charging users a flat fee based on the rate of flow determined by meter size and actual usage. It was determined that the Village was operating their water and sewer system at a deficit and they were moving funds to cover continuing losses. It was the council's opinion that the village could not continue this practice without serious consequences for the future. The township of Oxford is going to see still more development. Burton Katzman developers want to build 360 units of a multi-family residential development on 56 acres just north of the village. The developer, based in Bingham Farms, has already submitted plans to the Township Planning Commission. Burton Katzman is also involved with the possible development of 13 acres located near Oxford High School where the housing for 500 international students is being proposed. Scott Woody never reached a dream of becoming a teacher at Oxford High School. However, from 2003 to 2012, he played a vital part in the education of students as a tutorial assistant with Oxford's successful automotive program. Scott made it a personal mission to make sure that students working with him were headed in the right direction for success. Scott Woody will never reach a dream of being a teacher with an accepted teaching degree, but he did achieve respect from all who knew and liked him. Sadly, Scott passed away too soon on August 17th after a courageous battle with cancer. He was 50 years old, and he leaves his wife of 26 years, Ruth, daughter Andrea, and son Zachary. Terry? That's a sad thing. I, that's, it's always hard to hear the loss of somebody that the students respect and who lift them up and carry them through. 
Um, but that's a great program there, and I think that they'll survive and carry on in his name. He's a very talented man, and uh, the kids did like him. Uh, he worked with computers, that mm -hmm. kind of thing, you know, for automobiles, yeah, and right. which is a difficult part to diagnose. Yes, it is. Yeah. What do you think about the boom going on in Oxford? I'm really happy to see it. It, it does say something for our own economy, anyhow, mm -hmm. that it's picking up a bit. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know about across the nation. They, I keep hearing good and bad. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Yes, it, but here it is, and that's a good thing. Yeah, I say hooray for yeah, the building right. business. I think and, it's great. And, and it's good for the taxes. <laughs> Absolutely. It's good for everybody around us. Now I want to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. um, the the uh, sewer increase, uh -huh. sewer prices increase, that's not on um, the, the leakages that have been going on in the village throughout <clears throat> the last hundred oh. years is not on the backs of the taxpayers, right? That's mm -hmm. strictly for... Right. You're talking about the geysers that are coming out yeah, of the ground? Yeah, every now and again, <laughs> they have a big busted pipe, but... Right. No, uh, the consumer, you the resident out there, uh, will only pay for the water that passes through the meter. Good. So anything mm -hmm. prior to that, if Good. you have big gushers <laughs> occurring, uh, the village will Which have happens. to take care of that. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. Once in a while, it's tough for us to get through the news. <laughs> I had a hard time with my stories, but you are watching Oxford News this week. And if you'd like to learn more about these stories and others, first of all, watch us. And secondly, go to any local store and pick up a copy of the Oxford Leader newspaper. Coming up next on OCTV, Oxford Local Sports with Andy Curtis and Oxford News uh, School News with John Olchins. And join us with Auto Talk and Science in the News with Dave Kenny. I'm Terry Stiles, and this is Oxford News This Week, bringing your news closer to home. And I'm Elgin Nichols. Remember, always be kind to your friends and neighbors, and thanks for watching. For a free pair of tickets to this year's 2014 Michigan Renaissance Festival, send a self-addressed and stamped envelope to Oxford Community Television at 1775 North LaPere Road, Oxford, Michigan, 48371, Unit C. Huzzah! I'm Oakland County Sheriff Mike Bouchard and former Red Wing great Joey Koser reminding you to follow the rules regarding boater safety. Always operate at safe speeds, avoid alcohol, and wear a life jacket. Don't let a great day on the water be ruined by bad decisions. You are watching the Michigan American Legion's Station of the Year for the fifth year in a row. Oxford Community Television. Welcome to this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from the publication Automotive News. In our first story, Ford Motor Company is planning to introduce a new hybrid gasoline electric car in the late 2018 to compete against the best-selling Toyota Prius. Two sources with knowledge of the company's plans told Reuters on August 20th. The as-yet-unnamed vehicle will be built just outside Detroit. The sources say Ford eventually could offer several different body styles of the new hybrid, as Toyota does with the Prius. There will be different versions of the car's gasoline electric drivetrain, including a more expensive plug-in model that can be recharged from an electrical outlet. The new Ford Hybrid is expected to arrive as a 2019 model roughly 21 years after the introduction of the original Prius in Japan. Toyota is planning to unveil its fourth-generation Prius late next year, the sources said. Ford plans to build a new hybrid at its Wayne Assembly Plant in southeastern Michigan at an annual rate of about 120,000 vehicles a year. And at GM, an 8-speed automatic transmission debuting in the 2015 Chevrolet Corvette boosts fuel economy by 3.5% over the 6-speed it replaces and gives General Motors long-running sports car an EPA highway rating of 29 miles per gallon, the highest rating ever. The 2015 Corvette Stingray with the 8-speed automatic will be EPA rated at 16 city, 29 highways mile per gallon, and 20 miles per gallon combined. The Corvette is equipped with paddle shifters and fast-acting electronic solenoids that enable faster shifts than most dual-clutch transmission used in sports cars such as the Porsche 911 Turbo. The 2015 Singray with the 8-speed automatic is faster to 60 miles per hour than the manual transmission-equipped Corvette.
Production of the 2015 Corvette began a few days ago at GM's plant in Bowling Green, Kentucky. GM built just over 37,000 2014 Corvettes and is still working to clear a backlog of orders. <clears throat> And on the safety front, car buyers and owners can now use a vehicle's identification number to identify open or unrepaired safety recalls with a new search tool released by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. The recall search tool is available on NHTSA's website. Consumers enter a bin to find out whether the vehicle has any open, unrepaired, and whether the automaker uh, recalls and whether the automaker has a fix available. The introduction of the search tool comes as automakers led by General Motors recall a record number of light vehicles in the United States. The search tools database covers light vehicles dating back 15 years. After the VIN is entered into the search engine, open recalls are noted in red text. Vehicles without open recalls or recalls that already have been repaired will not garner any re uh, search results. NHTSA is also working with the National Automobile Dealers Association to integrate the VIN search tool at dealerships. NHTSA is also requiring that major light vehicle manufacturers provide VIN search capabilities for uncompleted recalls on their own company websites. They will be obligated to update the data at least weekly because NHTSA's VIN search tool relies on the information provided by those automakers. And still on the safety front, after more than a decade of research into car-to-car -car communications, U.S. auto safety regulators took a step forward August 18th by unveiling their plan for requiring cars to have wireless gear that will enable them to warn drivers of danger. These vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle or V2V transmitters and software won't be cheap, costing an estimated $341 to $350 per vehicle in 2020, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration said in a report. But the technology could save thousands of lives and prevent hundreds of thousands of crashes each year by providing cars with information they never would be able to gather simply from cameras and sensors. Just two of the possible features that rely on V2V technology, one that warns drivers if they don't have enough time to make a left turn, and another that urges them to stop if another car is about to run a red light, could prevent 25,000 to 592,000 crashes and save 49 to 1,083 lives annually when the entire U.S. vehicle fleet has the technology, according to the report. The report also included a draft version of standards that may be proposed by the time uh, President Barack Obama leaves office in 2017. The current V2V system is set up in such a way that cars swap messages 10 times per second about their position in space, which direction they are headed, and how quickly they are moving in that direction. If two cars are on a collision course, the driver can be presented with a warning. Eight ma ma major manufacturers, Ford Motor Company, General Motors, Honda, Hyundai, Daimler, uh, uh, the mixed Mercedes, and Nissan and Toyota and Volkswagen have been developing V2V technology in tandem with the government through a group called the Crash Avoidance Metrics Partnership, or CAMP. Despite the cost of the technology, automakers have embraced it as a way to make driving safer. Well, that's all for this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and as always, may the wind be at your back as you cruise down life's highways. Stay tuned to Oxford Community Television, and we'll be right back. Take off your hat, throw it in the corner. Take off your hat, throw it in the corner. Take off your hat, throw it in the corner. I don't see why you stay a little longer. I'm talking about Uzu. You're watching Oxford Community Television, keeping it local. I'm John Ochens and welcome to the Oxford Wildcats School Update. 
You can tell the days of summer are waning when the school parking lots fill up and it's time to do pictures and meet the teachers. Lakeville Elementary was among the first to start the process. Over in transportation, the focus has been on getting the 55 bus fleet ready to go. We visited with mechanics Mark Hillebrand and Mike Strong. They pointed out that most maintenance is really ongoing, but there are some projects such as vandalism repairs that can take more time. Mark tells us more. I mean, we yeah. do see a lot of vandalism. It costs us hundreds and hundreds of dollars a year to repair what's probably just vicious stuff that could, that could be avoided. We checked in with Pat Mueller over at Oxford Early Childhood. She tells us about improvements in their infant and toddler program. In the last few years, we've been had a mixed age groups of infants and toddlers together. We could have eight to 12 students, something like that. Now we have expanded and we can have more toddlers and more infants and they're in separate rooms so that we're meeting the specific needs of infants and the specific needs of toddlers. We are thrilled. Um, we're, so we do have spaces now. Finally, we have some spaces in our infant program uh, and our toddler program as well. How, how old, uh, what's the oldest that you can accept children for? for? In the toddler room, it's basically between one and three. Okay, and, and how many hours per day and how many days Well, that's, day? it's very much up to the parent. We are here from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So parents can choose any time during that time that they can bring their student children. Obviously, most people don't bring them for 12 hours, but somewhere during that time, parents will often need care. And what we want for our infants and toddlers, the most at-risk population of all, they're so difficult to leave. <laughs> and it's important that they have care that's really very high quality. Besides, besides age, is there a special qualification for no. this? No. Parents pay tuition. Um, the infant group also, those kids are anywhere from six weeks to a year, right in that time frame. We do put them together with the teacher. We have teachers who have their degrees and um, have met all the special requirements to being an infant toddler teacher. And we, put, we group those kids together so that they stay together in a group through their, throughout their infant and toddler program. Pat also tells us of the expansion of the Great Start Readiness Program. Um, that we're able to provide preschool programs using the Great Start Readiness Program through the state of Michigan in each of the elementary schools. So we'll have um, a classroom at Clear Lake and a classroom at DA and a classroom here, um, one at Leonard and one at Lakeville. So we'll be in all the elementary schools. For more details, you need to call Pat Mueller at 248-969-5035. Kim Buren is head of youth services over at the Oxford Library. We paid her a visit and found out about the success of their summer reading program. We had a wonderful summer reading program this year. We had a record 720 children uh, register for the program. That's uh, up quite a lot from previous years. And they did a tremendous job with their reading this summer. We have a board over here that celebrates their successes. We have a list of our children who completed the program. And um, at Oxford Public Library, we keep track of how many days the children read. So every day that they read at least 20 minutes, they put a sticker on their sticker chart. And so this year, the kids all together read 12,537 days, which was wonderful. Um, when they read um, their books and read for the days of reading, every five days of reading, they earn a reading coin, and then they save their reading coins and can spend them in our little bookstore that we create just for the summer. And that um, is a transformation of our story time room. And we have books that are mostly donated books that patrons donate, uh, children's books, and the children can use their coins and buy books that they get to keep. Kim Buren. If you haven't stopped by the library lately, you should pay Kim, Brian, and the staff a visit. They recently got a grant to purchase some new materials for kids with special needs, as well as some other upgrades. That's the Oxford School Update for this week. Dave follows with Science in the News, and then Andy with Sports. This is Oxford Community Television, keeping it local.
for a free pair of tickets to this year's 2014 Michigan Renaissance Festival. Send a self-addressed and stamped envelope to Oxford Community Television at 1775 North LaPay Road, Oxford, Michigan, 48371, Unit C. Huzzah! out for Friday night fish at the Oxford American Legion Hall. It's delicious. We love the Legion. They have great fish and good family fun. American Legion fish fry. It's awesome. And the drinks are good. The food is good. The service is awesome. Hi, I'm Andy Curtis, and this is your Oxford Sports Update. Well, I received some news from the doctors this past weekend, and it turns out I've been diagnosed with a pretty serious fever. Football fever! And the only cure is four days away this Friday the 29th when the Wildcats kick off their season with the first home game against Romeo. And remember, OCTV will be there to cover every home game this season as Coach Rowley and the boys march to the postseason. But you don't have to wait that long for European football as the varsity soccer team started their season last week with a 1-0 win over Fenton. The Wildcats and the Tigers were tied 0-0 with the Cats getting a lot of great scoring opportunities until junior Greg Knox took the ball at midfield and passed a sophomore Nick Wright who beat out two Fenton defenders and booted the ball to the back of the net putting the Cats up 1-0. This was the way that it would stay, too, for the Wildcats as their defense started throwing up some walls in the second half, led by seniors Travis Alderman, Drew Connolly, Drew Knox, Trevor Dean, and Nathan Sharp, with junior goalie Connor Bandell shutting out the Tigers with four saves. This Tuesday will be the first time the home fans will get to see the squad as they take on OAA rival Farmington. Now back to American football the way God intended it to be. The Lions had their third preseason game on Friday against Jacksonville at Ford Field in lovely downtown Detroit. Now unlike the rest of the preseason games, the third game is typically a good showcase of what we can expect to see in the regular season, with the starters playing well into the third quarter. But in typical Lions fashion, let's hope it's not the case with penalties being the focus of the 13-12 win. Penalties that cost the Motor City Kitties 131 yards and forced them to need to gain at least 20 yards on offense three separate times. Intentional grounding, Sue roughing the passer, holding and unnecessary roughness, which were all staples under the past Schwartz regime, resurfaced again under Caldwell last Friday. Now, let's move to the Diamond, where I'm going to try something different and uh, try to be positive about the Tigers as they split a four-game series in Minnesota with the Twins over the weekend, winning Sunday's afternoon game 13-4 and hopefully looking to creep back into early season form with the bats waking up a little bit and Justin Verlander looking very Verlandian on Saturday's win. Now, this split exactly doesn't get them any closer to the playoffs, though. Uh, they're still trailing the Royals by two games in the Central and are one game out of the last AL wildcard spot. The start of football season is the main focus of this weekend. Again, under strict doctor's orders, I give you today's sports vocab word of the day. <laughs> Roughing the passer, which in football is a penalty that a defensive player makes when he makes contact with the quarterback after the quarterback has released the ball from his hands. Now the only way this is waived is if the defender makes contact due to some sort of previous momentum and can also be called if an intimidating act toward the passer is committed. So for example, uh, just think about anything Sue does during a game. Now I'm Andy Curtis and remember you can catch all of our broadcasts of your favorite park and rec league games and upcoming fall high school sports right here between 1 and 6 on OCTV. Or check us out online under the program section of OCCTV.org. And as I remind you every week, this is your sports station. So if you have an idea, shoot us an email at andrewcurtis23 at gmail.com and put OCTV Sports in the subject line. Well, that was all the sports news you need to know. Thanks for watching and have a great day.
Welcome to Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from the publication New Scientist. What goes 33 feet per second? Well, that's the speed at which salmon are launched from a salmon cannon that propels them over dams so they can breed up river. That invention has been tested on dams in Washington State, and the salmon are lining up for it. In our next story, three people with alopecia in the U.S. are finally getting to have a good hair day after treatment with the drug ruxolitinib. The drug, currently used to treat bone marrow condition called myelofibrosis, was found to reverse the patchy baldness caused by alopecia in five months. Well, sorry, but it's no good for me or for others with male pattern baldness. Darn it all. <laughs> and for the second time in Iceland, in, five, in four years, volcanic ash could soon be erupting from Iceland. On Monday, the Icelandic Meteorological Office raised the light risk level of danger to the second highest following increasing activity beneath Bardabunga, Iceland's largest volcanic system. In 2010, another volcano's eruption closed much of Europe's airspace. And in nature, when they climb trees and slopes, snakes produce three times as much gripping power as is necessary, suggesting that avoiding a fall is of higher priority to them than conserving energy. The finding holds true for 10 snake species and me so far. On the technology front, Google is building the largest store of knowledge in human history, and it's doing so without any human help. Instead, Knowledge Vault autonomously gathers and merges information from across the web into a single base of facts about the world and the people and the objects in it. The breadth and accuracy of this gathered knowledge is already becoming the foundation of systems that allow robots and smartphones to understand what people ask them. It promises to let Google answer questions like an oracle rather than a search engine and even turn a, news len a new lens on human history. Knowledge Vault is a type of knowledge base, a system that stores information so that machines as well as people can read it. Where a database deals with numbers, a knowledge base deals with facts. When you type, where was Madonna born into Google, for example, the place given is pulled from Google's existing knowledge base. This existing base, called Knowledge Graph, relies on crowdsourcing to expand its information. But the firm noticed that growth was stalling. Humans could only take it so far. So Google decided it needed to automate the process. It started building the vault by using an algorithm to automatically pull in information from all over the web using machine learning to turn the raw data into knowledge. Knowledge Vault has pulled in 1.6 billion facts to date. Of these, 271 million are rated as confident facts to which Google model ascribes a more than 90% chance of being true. It does this by cross-referencing new facts with what it already knows. Knowledge Vault offers Google fast automatic expansion of its knowledge and it's only going to get bigger. As well as the ability to analyze text on a web page for facts to feed its knowledge base, Google also can peer under the surface of the web hunting for hidden sources of data such as the figures that feed Amazon product pages, for example. Wow! And in Africa, too many out, not enough in. More elephants are dying in Africa than are being born thanks to a dramatic rise in poaching. George Widemeyer of Colorado State University in Fort Collins and his colleagues studied elephant carcasses from Samburu National Reserve in Kenya to determine the cause of death, then combined this information with records of elephant poaching across Africa. They found that since 2009, up to 40,000 elephants, 8% of the total, have been killed illegally each year, and the population as a whole has shrunk by up to 3% annually, and that's not good. Well, that's it for this edition of Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny. Stay tuned to Oxford Community Television, and we'll be right back.